Hello, hello. Um, after uh, seeing some videos around YouTube about wave function collapse, I decided I would try to implement my own version of that. And in fact, I have uh, pushed this up as a public repo on GitHub, so I will leave a link in the bottom. Uh, you know, in the, in the video description. So, as I understand it, wave function is uh, a thing where you choose one item, and then because of your choice of an item, uh, probabilities of other items around that item or related to that item are reduced so that you uh, can become more and more certain what the next piece could be. You reduce the probability. So it can be used for uh, designing, you know, tile systems like this. And there's a whole bunch of videos that go into explaining it. But uh, in this video, uh, I want to actually talk about implementation and uh, ignore the purring. I the cat just jumped in my lap. This happens all the time. <sighs> so what you see here is a set of uh, seven by seven tiles and each one of them has a different fit and can connect to tiles following certain rules. I do recommend a uh, video actually this guy here uh, DVGen why I'm using wave function collapse he talked about all kinds of cool things but this is where I really got the gist of how wave function collapse works um, but here I've made like uh, an interactive demo that you can run in React.js. It's using a uh, Vite, so you have to do an npm run dev rather than an npm start in order to start the server, or just type in Vite after you run npm install. Uh, anyhow, so in this little demo here, I can click uh, start and start with like a single node, and then it will figure out tiles via connection rules and slowly fill out the map. You can do this any way you want. You can look at a, a spot and just decide to arbitrarily put a tile there with, uh, with whatever possibilities are um, remaining or you can always place tiles next to another tile. The wave function collapse part is that once you've chosen a tile, you know that only certain tiles can connect to that tile. And so it reduces the choice of what tiles you have to choose from, although you can still make that a random choice. So if I turn on this little checkbox here, it shows show remaining possibilities and start it over again. You can see that um, as certain tiles are to chosen here, this three, this uh, means there's only three possibilities or two possibilities for that spot. Um, <laughs> this is a dam tile here um, that goes horizontally across and only um, another dam tile can connect to it. So it kind of determines what sort of, what, what you can get out of it. But uh, less about what wave function collapse is, because I do recommend you check out another video for that. Um, and more about how it works like a good good implementation under the hood based on the understanding I had so uh, first you have to come up with a set of tiles and uh, those tiles will um, have rules about what kind of tile they can connect to now the guy um, guy in the video he recommended one way is by encoding encoding the each side with a code that basically describes you know the transition between different materials so as you can see this is what I call white tile but it's kind of like sand and so on all sides it's www but here on this uh, white with green quarter it's wbg because white then there's a black border and then there's green so you can say that uh, WBG has to connect to a GW, GBW, blah, uh, which is the mirror image of this. And same with all these. 
Now the easy thing is to create a tile. This is all actually done uh, completely in CSS. I'll show you. <laughs> I, I don't I don't do texture editing, so you can see that this uh, this quarter circle is just a div with a uh, border over here and a border radius, and it's it's literally just that, and then rotated using uh, transform rotate. 90 degrees, 180 degrees, etc. So this is my basic tile set. So you can see over here, uh, there's BBG, which is blue, black, green. And I use blue and black are both B because there's only ever black in the middle if there's a B or there's blue. I, well, okay. There's B here for blue but anyway there's no there's no uh, actual name collisions uh, in this rule set so basically you have to have typically one of each tile for each possible rotation of that tile um, that you want to include so it requires duplicates which means it's easy to make one tile and then you know, have a rule that creates rotated versions of that tile so let's see what that looks like in actual code. I know lots of people use VS Code. I pay for a version of WebStorm because I really like it. <laughs> but uh, that aside here, let's see. Well, let's get to the top here. Uh, okay, I'm using Styled Components. Really good library if you want to just stick your CSS right inside your your JSX files instead of you know having external CSS files so I got these tile bases here everything is built half fields damn endings damn left side middle I'm actually not using half field white I could just you know delete that one and I'm also not using this just because of how I compose these. Um, so yeah. Um, so then what I got is I got these basic shapes here. And I just specify an angle to rotate by. So these are just composited of like here's a green tile with a quarter white circle on it. To make a three quarter green tile. You know, it's like white with uh, three quarters of it green. But it's basically enough to be green, so I'm just putting a quarter white circle to get the same effect. Um, anyway, so you stack these things here. Two blue quarters is um, like these guys here. Uh, where is it? This guy here, where, you know, it's got two green quarters on it. So, yeah. Uh, let's get back to the code. So then I create this enum and it has all the side codes that are possible in it. I could use strings for them, but uh, I'm just allowing, I'm, I'm using a TypeScript, I'm a big fan of TypeScript, but um, TypeScript enums will just make a map of these strings like www will be assigned to zero, kind of like an enum in other languages. But I could say equals www like this if I wanted to. That makes things complicated, as I'd probably prefer to have them all strings or all numbers. You can kind of make them whatever you want, really. Um, and now I have these side mappings, and these side mappings map each color to its opposite. So each side, uh, green, green, black, white, goes to white, black, green. And green, black, blue goes to bla blue, black, green, and so on and so forth. And then the damn left side can only connect to a damn right side. You're damn right! Anyway, um, so then here we have a definition of a tile, and this is kind of the bread and butter of how, um, you know, how, how the tile itself is represented in memory and how it's propagated. Um, so you have a tile, which is the uh, React component itself. And then you have the angle, which refers to what angle it's rotated at. This is so I can reduce um, the unique number of tiles I actually have to have. Um, weight. This is a probability weight. 
So you could think of all the probabilities as default having a weight of one. But if you have uh, two items and one has a weight of one and one has a weight of two, then the one with the weight of two is twice as likely to be picked um, as the weight of one. That is, if you add their probabilities together, you get three. And so then you divide that out and you get uh, that one has one third percent, you know, one third probability of being picked and the other has two thirds probability of being picked. So I've allowed for a weighted system. And what you could do with that is when you're selecting out of a pool of remaining, remaining, um, oh, let's just go back here. So like once you see you have four of them here, you can choose, say, uh, one of them using weighted probability. Or you can just arbitrarily choose any point on this grid with a weighted probability. Like say you like, want like solid land or you like, uh, you like large lakes, you can make the blue tile more popular a choice than the blue with green border or the green corner. You know, and that would make the bodies of water probably artificially larger. Um, well, not artificially, but everything's artificial here. Uh, so, so I decided to add weighting to it. I could even add sliders, but I didn't feel like cluttering up my interface with lots of sliders, but have sliders that can, like, real-time change the uh, probabilities of things. Uh, let's see. Mm, here's a tile matrix, but actually I'm not sure that I'm even using that anywhere. Uh, I think I, I removed it for a different kind of uh, definition. So here's the tile set. The tile set is all these tile definitions here. So you get the white tile, and I set the side codes to all white. Weight 1.5, so I want it to be a little bit more frequent than other tiles. Here's white with green quarter. I want, uh, you know, corner pieces to show up less often. So, um, and then I have the same white with green quarter uh, at 90, at 180, and I have to change the side codes to match that. So I'm using a north, south, east, west system. So, uh, and that's actually how I'm printing them out on the user interfaces by iterating through these uh, cards here and printing out their north, south, east, and west. So anyway, uh, going through this long list here, I'll stop by the dam part though. Because the dam is the only tile that's so unique that it like only connects with one other kind of tile. Or, well, two other kinds. But um, see, here's the, the, the right side. Its west side has to connect to another piece because this is the far the far east side of the dam and so it can only go out west this part connects with land on the east side so yeah and the dl means dam left not dam west i i don't know why i chose left and right whenever i abandoned that whole idea when i used compass coordinates um anyway here's here's the middle part of the dam so it can connect with the right side on its east side and the left side on its west side. Now this is the blue tile, it's all blue all the way around. So then uh, I made a, an array of all the side codes and this next part, this next part's a little thick. So um, <clears throat> where did I develop side mappings? Oh yes, okay, so recall side mappings is where, um, let's just rename this, side opposites map. There, less ambiguous for you. Um, so this, this is a map where you put in a normal side and you get its opposite out. So here, what we're saying is that if I, if I have like a www as my east side and I, or like, sorry, a, a, say GBW as my east side, then I want to find out all tiles who has a west side of WBG, which is the opposite. So what we're doing here is for the east side, 
I'm looking up for every side code possible, its opposite, and I'm building a list of tiles whose west side equals the opposite of my east side. So I have a quick lookup to get to get all the tiles that are possible on that side. I hope I hope that makes sense. Um, I also am using a bit of a thick bit of code here to describe it. I like using maps and filters and stuff like that, but I'm just going through each element and I'm returning an array. Uh, I'm returning basically that code, which is uh, the east side code. I'm going to look it up by its east code, but I'm going to get the opposite code for the west side. So I'm going through each tile. Okay, so sorry, let me explain. The initializer for map is an array of key comma value. And so my key is a side code and my value is a tile definition array. And these tiles represent the tiles whose opposite side matches up with the east side. And the same here, like this is the north map and I got the side opposite of north, which is the south side. So I'm finding all the tiles who match the south side. So I think this is pretty much explained here. Um, let's uh, let's let's dig into the the controls really quick just to explain how we're going through the solving process, the very high level of it. First, this is a grid, so we have to create a grid. Uh, my tile grid is just a two-dimensional array of, uh, well, it's an array of arrays. There's not a properly two-dimensional array in JavaScript. But basically, it's an array of um, a tile, which can be null if there's not a tile yet, and the possibilities for what that tile could be, which is an array of those tile items. And so you can count how many possibilities there are with possibilities.count. So, first thing I do is I have a button here. Uh, wow, it's down at the very bottom here. Start button. And whenever you click it to go start, it calls create grid. We'll come up to create grid here. If it's not running, we're going to set it running. And this will keep the loop running. And then um, our first step is to create a tile grid with the grid size we've chosen here. So this will initialize an empty grid where every tile is null and the possibilities are full arrays of every possibility that there is. And then, uh, depending on how many starter nodes we pick on the slider, uh, we'll add randomly um, that number of new nodes to the grid. And this grid is immutable thanks to uh, being part of uh, you know, part of a recoil state hook. And so we'll set the tile grid using a set, a set state, basically. And then um, at the refresh rate, we will uh, tick a number up. And so the set tick increments the tick number here. And then so I have a uh, use effect hook with a tick param that has a primary dependency on tick so every time tick increments, it uh, runs this bit of code here. And then after an in interval, it sets tick up again. So uh, tick runs until it's either not running or we've run out of nodes to fill in. <sighs> Let's see. Where do I go from here? Um, I will explain that this is a use granular effect hook. Uh, most use effect hooks are, uh, they, they, you know, the use effect hook in general has one array of dependencies, your, your, your only dependency array, and basically any variable that you reference inside that effect hook has to be referenced there. However, that makes it hard when you only want to rely on one thing changing. So there's this um, package on NPM called granular hooks and it allows you to have 
a primary and secondary dependency list. So you can put your dependencies that you rely on in your secondary list and only listen to the one here in the primary dependencies that you actually want to trigger your hook when it updates. This can result in uh, effective hooks with fewer updates. I don't know why this is not baked straight into uh, React. Um, and then there's also use granular callback, but I'm not entirely sure what the benefit of that is. I don't understand how that one's supposed to work. Um, because it's not like the callback is called every time one of these values changes, but I guess it does have to have up-to-date references to them. Again, yeah, this is a little confusing for me, actually. Um... So, uh, stop it, cat. It's clawing at the bag of cat food because it smells, and he doesn't like things that smell. Anyway, um, cats try to bury things that are too fragrant. <sighs> Where was I? So, we got the tile grid here, and set tile grid. This is another cool thing. Uh, recoil state. I don't use Redux. I mean, there's all kinds of people who are for it, but it's really boily platey. It's really kind of confusing. It's hard to follow. And uh, I've avoided it like the plague. I, I worked professionally with it like once and hated it. And once I, I, I looked up for alternatives, I found recoil. And uh, this is like gravy for me. So this is a, a this is a shared state of in what you call an atom and it's um available in any component that just uses the use recoil state there's also variations on this like use recoil value where you only get the value not a setter or you can use set recoil state to just get a setter and not the value so um it's it's pretty pretty effective here so this is the control component which sets all the states so it's using use recoil state now we're going to go over to the tile grid let's get down here where it's relevant we use use recoil value to get the the tile or you know the two-dimensional tile array and then also the zoom and the ability to show possibilities things like that um so that's how we update the other view is that this one's only updated when these values change um i'll show you the i'll show you the atoms though it's really easy here's my tile grid atom it is an atom of tile grid array type uh if you're not using typescript you don't even have to put that in there and you just give it a name i don't know if there's a proper way to name these but it's a string so Anything that's a proper key in an uh, object, yeah, any string, any valid string is good. And then um, the default value is just an empty two-dimensional array of one by one. Um, this is not really in use here, but zoom is just you know a number, default one. Show possibilities is a Boolean here, default false. So it's really easy to define these atoms. And then you just use recoil state, you know, use set recoil state, use recoil value. Just getting that intercommunication question out of the way. Because I'm not, because you see I'm avoiding using props at all here. I'm not prop drilling or, you know, doing hierarchical state because atoms just make it not necessary here. Okay. So, um... Back to the control, uh, we'll go over the first step here. You create the tile grid. So that goes into tile grid solver here. Create, yeah, create tile grid, here it is. So, um, you pass in a width and a height. Right now we're using the same number for both. So uh, this is basically just one array and we are iterating over basically x 
and creating another array, which is y. And then pushing elements into the y array, then pushing that into the x array and creating a new y array until we're done. And you see the tile is null. And the possibilities is the entire tile set, basically. Um, we're using the dot 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 spread operator here so that um, we don't risk mutating the original tile set array by, um, how should I put it, by changing any of the possibilities in this array. Um, so we create that. And then there's this edge set here. And this edge set is that uh, as we add tiles to the grid, as we fill in tiles, the edge set is a set of all grid coordinates where there's a tile adjacent, but it's not filled in. So this is kind of like the uh, the candidates. The edge set is the, the list of candidates for being filled in that are adjacent to already filled in tiles. So as we fill in tiles, we remove them from the edge set. And whenever we create a new, new tile, uh, we find all of its adjacent empty spots and put them in the edge set. It's just handy. And so we can check if there's any empty nodes left because we'll know because the size of the edge set will still be greater than zero. Once edge set reaches zero size, then we know we've exhausted the set. Um, for any of you who are not familiar with the set in JavaScript, I have met people who are like, what's a set? What's a map? I mean, a map is kind of like a plain JavaScript script object, but a set is just a faster way of using like, uh, of looking up stuff sort of in a key value store, except you can even store objects in a set. Like you can store anything um, in a set as opposed to a key value store where the key has to be a string. And even if you use a number as a key in a JavaScript object, that key that that number will still be cast into a string. So um, you would just use set.add to add a value, set.delete to remove a valuable value, and set.has to look up a value. And then you can also for each to iterate over its members, or you can uh, get an iterator back with values or entries or keys. Uh, values and keys are basically aliases for the same thing. But the way to actually get an array from it is use array.from set.values or set.keys. So, uh, hmm. and you can wipe out the set with dot .clear. Uh, it doesn't replace the set, it just cleans out the inside of it. So none of these are destructive or whatever the set is. Uh, the set object itself is unaltered. So at the beginning of creating the tile grid, we clear the set. But then uh, the next step over in tile controls is we add some new nodes. So we pass in the grid, we get a new grid out. We also pass in the number of nodes that we want to create. So this gets a little technical here. So each time you add a node to the grid, you have to recalculate which tiles are allowed for every adjacent tile to it. And then to every adjacent tile to that tile, you also have to find out what possible nodes are for that. Like say, say, um, I'll, I'll give you an example here. Uh, I mean, you saw it, you saw it before, but suppose I have sand here and I want to connect to water, well, I obviously can't put water directly next to sand. However, if you look at this tile set carefully, you will see that sand is only ever adjacent to grass. So white is only adjacent to green, um, and that's through a connector block. So one block away, I could connect white to, say, this tile here, which is a uh, white with green half, and then two blocks away, I could connect to green, and then three blocks away, I could connect to um, green with blue half, and four blocks away, finally, I could connect to water. So 
each time you set one tile, you also have to update for every tile um, nearby in a radius around it um, its new set of possibilities. And I'll, I'll go through this one slowly here. I'm going to change the refresh delay high and uh, start and show remaining here. So you see that the default is 34 possibilities. I have 34 tiles, but as I fill this out here, now there's four. And then this one, because there's four here, uh, there's 19. So how do we calculate that? That is the question. But I mean, before we calculate that, you have to know that each time you add a tile, you have to recalculate this entire thing. You don't add more than one tile and then calculate it. Um, thought experiment. Suppose I, suppose I added two tiles at once. However, once I add one tile, I might cut down the number of possibilities for what the other tile could be, especially if they were adjacent. If I just added two tiles at the same time without recalculating the possibility, instead of doing one at a time and recalculating possibilities between them, I could actually wind up with incompatible tiles side by side. So that's going to lead into um, this explanation here is that in act X, add new nodes here. Um, we have number of nodes left to add. And then while the nodes left is greater than zero, we'll just randomly choose a point on the grid using the uh, grid's length minus one. I'm using a random library. Um, let's see that random library. It's, uh, well, random.js here. And they have like better random functions than math.random. Um, math.random apparently is problematic. Let's get back to adding X new nodes. So, so we get an integer in the range of 0 to length minus 1 of each dimension, and then we pull a node from that grid. And so if this node is not, um, does not have a tile assigned to it yet, you can see tile definition or a null is an option. So if it's null, then we can uh, pick one out of the possibilities. So we'll just say we've chosen this node, so we're going to de decrement the nodes left. Uh, then what we're going to do is we're going to assign this grid square a new tile uh, value. So this tile will be a weighted probability choice. As I mentioned, they each have weights of all the possibilities and the possibilities are all tile definitions so they have the tile the north south east west the weight and the angle in them so we're just creating a little mapping of probability and item uh, for the uh, choose weighted probability function uh, i could get into the weighted probability function it's it's a really simple pretty simple function anyway um, but the part I'm trying to get to is once we've chosen our node, we need to tell the rest of the grid that that new node's there and limit the probabilities of you know what what possible nodes remain. This is the wave function collapse part. So we say uh, do this wave collapse starting at this grid coordinates. This is the grid coordinates of the node I just updated. So I just collapsed its probability by randomly choosing among its possibilities. And now everything else near it has to know that the possibilities have been updated too. So let's go finally to propagate wave collapse. Um, this is the other where you can uh, add by adjacent nodes as opposed to random nodes. So, uh, that's why I'm stopping here again. Uh, let's see. But on to the actual wave function collapse. So this is the meat. This is basically like the magic maker of the whole uh, algorithm. So let's see here. We got the local grid. 
this is just a shorthand for copying a two-dimensional array so that um, so that it so that we maintain the immutable property of the input array um, of the input grid because um, React state and state management libraries like state to be immutable and like you to create a new state object each time you update state. So that's that's what we're doing here. We're doing that. So this is a copy of our input grid. We get the width and the height, and then uh, we need a queue. So each time we visit a node and the possibilities, uh, the number of possibilities it has changes. We need to also put on the queue to visit every neighboring node to make sure we update their possibilities as well. Like if I had, say, 19 possibilities, and then a node next to me got filled in, and now I only have four possibilities left, well, uh, I have to then visit all my other unfilled nodes around me and uh, see what their possibilities are, because the combination of those four parts probably have fewer possibilities to them when you add them all together than the previous node did. I mean, th than it did before that tile was added. <sighs> it's, it's really hard to put that into words, I think. But uh, this queue, basically, is something we can iterate over until it's empty. Uh, the idea being, once we find out that... Uh, that adjacency no longer affects the number of probabilities left. Like, um, let's start this over again here. You see how um, I filled this out. This is 4, 20, and 34 here. Once you reach a tile where this 20 here, these 20 possibilities are no longer affecting how many possibilities are here, then you don't need to actually solve for the possibilities here and here because these are outside because you know that there's 34 possibilities next to 34 tiles you know like so if you have 34 possibilities your neighbor has to have 34 possibilities too because that's the maximum number of possibilities you can have so but when you have like 11 possibilities some of those don't support certain tile ends so like this is probably not going to be a water tile you know uh so so this is probably not going to connect to a water tile either, or who, who knows? It's kind of kind of hard to put it, but we'll, we'll dig into it here. So the first thing we put on the queue actually is the coordinate that we are given, and um, so while so we start by popping that off the off the stack first, off the queue, we queue dot shift get it off the front of the queue here. If it doesn't exist, uh, we just break. So we get an X and a Y here. And so if it doesn't have a tile assigned, we'll assign it a tile. And we'll narrow down its list of possibilities to be that tile. So now this is a collapse node where um, basically it has a tile and now its possibilities is an array of length one. So, uh, we have to reassign this because this is immutable and this is not updated because we're actually assigning a new object here. And then here we move remove the tile from the edge set, not that it was in there. The first time around it's not in the edge set, but now it is. Well, I mean, but from now on things will be add, added to the edge set. So here we have add uncollapsed edge tiles to set. So centered around this, the unfilled north, south, east, west tiles will be added to the edge set. This is only so that we can choose randomly one of the edge to fill in if we want to. That's all it's used for. And also the edge set is used to calculate if we're done filling the grid in because it will be empty if we filled all of them in. But so, centered around this tile, north, south, east, and west, we have to update the possibilities of what the next tiles could be. So here on the north side, um, so north uh, up 
in the document, obviously, is negative. Like, uh, so zero is the top, and a hundred is below zero, because y goes downwards positive as opposed to upwards positive. So I automatically think that way. So y zero would be uh, norther than y one. So if this y coordinate is greater than zero, there is a north. If this y coordinate equals zero, it's as north as you can get. So then we're checking if the grid coordinates uh, one north of us is unfilled, you know, if the, if the tile is not full, um, not chosen, then we want to update its possibilities. Uh, we don't even want to bother processing it if it's already filled because its possibilities have been collapsed and there's nothing to update. So we get the list of its existing possibilities. Now here's where it gets technical. Uh, so basically the new possibilities as a result of that tile introduced gets intersected with the list of existing possibilities. And um, you can see this here when we start. You see there's four possibilities here. And there's four here, but this, if something filled in here, you see here, it changed to a two. Now that there's two tiles adjacent, that list had to be further cut down. So um, basically, as you add constraints to the system, like if you filled in this four here, you might force this tile into a one, and then it would automatically fill in because there's only one possibility left. It's kind of like how you solve a Sudoku. Um, so, uh, doo -doo -doo -doo. where was that code? Here we are. So you got the list of existing possibilities for that tile. Now the list of new possibilities is basically the uh, this fancy function which finds out all the adjacent possibilities and then compiles their possibilities into a list and then uh, unions them together and then intersects that with existing possibilities. Uh, I'm not sure I explained that well, but since this is the north you know, the possibilities of whatever's to the north, we get the uh, our north possibilities. Hmm. Wait, this node possibilities is um, just one. There's, there's only one possibility. So, and then we get all the existing possibilities and look up the north end of that, basically. Um, Let's, let's just go straight there, and I'll, I'll figure out if I can explain it a little better. So this possibilities is our node which is solved. Um, and now we're looking at the node to... We're looking at what side it has, basically. And we're going to say that for its possibilities here, uh, which is one... There's only one possibility for it. So this is an array of size one. We're going to look in the north side and use that north side code. Like if the if the tile was like a white, black, green, then we're going to get the code. We're going to get the map for that possibility, which is uh, green, black, white. Every single thing where the south side of the tile is green, black, white, we'll get all of those possibilities. And then we're going to combine them into one union and get, you know, of every possible combination, what could be on the north side. And then we're going to intersect that with the existing list of possibilities, hopefully to get a shorter list of possibilities so that the uh, number of possibilities goes down and we become more certain about what it could possibly be. So basically, each time you have a new node, you recalculate these for all, so you, over time, whittle them down. And that's why you can't just suddenly place two at once. One has to come before the other. Or else, you know, you might have, like, sand next to water, where it takes at least four tiles to bridge that gap. Um, This union operation actually makes more sense here. Once you have uh, an un, um, 
an unresolved, an un uncollapsed tile that already, like say it had four possibilities of what the tile could be, then you have to find out for each of those four possible tiles what their north side or what their south side could be and come up with every possible tile and then union that together because some of them are going to have similar tiles in common uh, and some of them aren't. So you have to union that together and then you have to uh, intersect that with the existing possible tiles because the existing possible tiles is already constrained by other tiles around it or other tiles around other tiles around it as the case may be and so that's how you narrow down the possibilities so let's go back up here actually this is the same block of code roughly uh, repeated four times because in each one we're checking the north the west the south and the east so um once we have our list of new possibilities, these are the possibilities that are remaining for this north tile in particular here. Uh, we do a check here. First, if there are fewer possibilities than there were before, we know that this tile has been constrained. This tile used to have more possibilities, but now it has fewer. Now there's some cases here. If there are zero possibilities, then you either have like a lapse in your tile set where there's just not a tile that can fill that kind of gap and everything is broken. This can let you know if there is such a scenario. But like the whole point of collapsing the probabilities is that is actually that it prevents you from running into a scenario like this. So you don't have to come up with some mad hat hack to fix it by the connection rules we are automatically narrowing down possibilities so that we're sure not to pick a possibility that's not allowed so here this is basically i just wrote this to be it should never happen but if it does you know here's what we do so what we do is we update that um we update the, the list of possibilities. We update this grid node. We set its tile to the, to the only possibility. If there is only one possibility for it, we will set the tile to that. Otherwise, the tile remains null. And we'll set the possibility to the new list of possibilities. Now, if, the possi if there is only one possibility, then we know this tile is resolved now. And so we're going to remove it from the edge set. Because the edge set is for unresolved tiles that are adjacent to resolved tiles but this is no longer unresolved if possibilities there's only one possibility so and then we'd add its edge you know it's a uh, uncollapsed neighbors if any to the edge set it doesn't matter if you add them twice because once you add something to a set it's either in the set or it isn't so that's that's the magic of sets is you can only add a thing to it once and if you keep adding it'll only have one copy it's not like an array where you can keep pushing the same thing onto it <coughs> so then because we just collapsed this possibility if that is to say we wound up with fewer possibilities then we know that we might need to recalculate the possibilities of its neighbor if the possibilities if the new possibilities were the same as the old possibilities, then there's really nothing to update about this node or its neighbors. So, but if, if there are fewer possibilities, then we need to update its unresolved neighbors. And so that's why we push this node's coordinates onto the queue. So what that will do, that will uh, stick it on the end of the queue, first come, first serve. So we'll just keep processing nodes until they all until every node that we process does not have any fewer possibilities than it did before. Basically, when we reach them where um, when we reach them where they're all 34s, once we reach a scenario like this, like we check this one, then we check this one, we check this one. Now, this one, this one is still 34. It didn't lose any, so we don't check this one. I mean. The, the example is kind of walking away on me as I'm telling you this, but 
I think you get it. It's a limiter that prevents us from having to check the entire tree. There, there's still a lot to check, you see. I mean, but, like, if this one was still two after the update of, like, this one, then there's no point in updating this one because, you know, it's on the other side of that. So, I hope that helped kind of get an understanding of what's going on here. Uh, let's see, what else is there? So, of course, as you fill them in, there's fewer edge tiles. So let's go back to tile controls here where you can see we have this, uh, this loop here. This loop constantly updates every time there's a tick. And that's at a certain refresh rate, which I have set to really slow right now. But all I'm doing is I'm just incrementing a number to call this thing using a set timer to increment this number so that this granular effect hook will keep running. So while, while it's running, if it's not running, it returns. While it's running, it will check to see if there's any nodes left to be filled in. And if there are, we will uh, do new adjacent nodes. And if we're not, then we're going to say running is false because we're done. There's nothing more to calculate. So let's look at add X new adjacent nodes here. Um, so you saw the first version of um, add, add adjacent nodes here. This just chose a random XY coordinate and made sure there was no tile, you know, uh, chosen for it, and then set that as the, you know, the choice. Well, add X new adjacent nodes does the same thing, except it pulls a random number from the edge set zero to the edge set size minus one. So this is a random number that can index any value in edge set. So edge set is a set. It's not an array, but we can get an array from it by calling array.from edge set dot values like this. And then we can plug in the index and we get a string. Uh, because the, uh, because strings are unique, but uh, like arrays and objects are instances, unless I had a copy of the instance, um, let, let's just say if I type like three, five equals, 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 uh, three, five, because these are actually two separate instances of the array, even though their values are the same, they're not going to be the same. So these are not candidates for a set. So actually what I'm doing to store the edge set is I'm storing it as three X five. Because I can say that is 3x5, like this. That is true. You know, so. Um, um, just to show you really quick, I have coordinates to string where I take x, y, and encode it using a, uh, I call those template strings, as, you know, x, x, y, um, and I split, I like these little chains here, but I split by X, map the number into a parse int, and then dump out that as an array of two numbers. Easy, easy peasy. So, um, and whenever I add the uncollapsed edge tile to the set, all I'm doing is I'm checking the grid cells around, seeing if they have a tile. If they don't, I'm converting their coordinates to a string and adding it to the edge set. So, so the edge set is a, is a string of X, you know, one value, X, another value. It's like saying X, X, Y just sounds bizarre. So, um, let's get back to that function. Where is it? Here it is. Uh, so, so we're just choosing one of those and then making sure that it really doesn't have a tile actually don't need to do this check um, but it's a carryover from copying off of this guy here from add x new nodes but when we're adding adjacent nodes we're just picking whatever's in the edge set 
and then whenever we set up the new copy of uh, you know the the new node for this and then run it through propagate wave collapse it'll remove it from the edge set for us and start start the whole ball rolling all over again um so um there you have it let's uh let's play around with this guy a little bit see i added a little zoom slider so we can have fun with it uh it becomes less performant the larger it gets because creating new arrays all the time is well it turns out to be expensive so i can hit start here and i'm gonna drag the slider as fast as it will go that's about as fast as it goes at that size you can see it's trying though also the whole ui becomes just so much slower because this is basically an 80 by 80 array of complex objects this is not some sort of c plus plus fancy data structure this is like meant to be rendered as you go as a like kind of an educational demonstration um so i'm gonna click you know stop so since i know it's good for me and i'm just gonna drop this down you know you have the size in each direction you get you know 25 percent the the load so we're gonna start again here you'll see it a lot faster so um sometimes you will actually see the dam structure show up and you think well how does it not cut off wind up cutting into something else but it's just because we collapse the probabilities that it, you know won't cut into the land it won't cut you won't it won't cut where it can't cut basically that's the thing is when you use wave function collapse you force the the generator to generate a scenario where you can never pick the wrong tile because you're picking only what's possible watch watch that video watch that video i really told you this guy's video why i'm using wave function collapse for procedural terrain really good really good at explaining it if i'm not good i just wanted to walk you through some code usually when you see a video they show you code but they kind of like skip over it really quick maybe they do give you a link but i wanted to explain the code bit by bit and walk through it slowly anyway um that's all i've got for you uh thanks for stopping by